you very much, Laura, and thank you um, for inviting me to give this uh, lecture today, which is a great honour, and um, I'm um, yeah, excited to tell you what I've been working on. So, as we know, digital technologies now permeate almost every hour of children's lives. They're not just in their hands, pockets, and by their pillows. But increasingly, technologies are built into the very environments where the children live, public transport, homes, schools. They promise exciting opportunities for leisure, learning, social connection, and participation. They also bring new risks of harm and amplify familiar and pressing problems. Yet children's interests remain disproportionately underrepresented in the design and operation of many digital products and services, and their voices go largely unheard in the rush to profit from the attention economy and data-driven business innovation. Digital business models address markets or users or audiences as generalities, seemingly unable to anticipate that these generalities are likely to include children. And thus they render invisible the specific needs and concerns of diverse children and young people, even though children are one in three of the world's internet users, and even though non-users as well are impacted by today's embedding of digital technologies in the very infrastructure of society. A rising tide of public concern is now demanding change, mobilized by anxieties about children's safety, privacy, development, exclusion, vulnerability. And although labels like vulnerable may downplay children's agency as independent rights holders, these public concerns are gaining momentum. And although there are good reasons to be suspicious of moral anxieties about techno-determinist discourses of societal decline, there's no question that the sense that something must be done is influencing the agenda of governments and via media campaigns, shareholder, investor and advertiser actions, it's affecting the business agenda also. So what changes are needed? My talk today is informed by a range of research projects broadly designed to uh, support evidence-based impact. Um, I worked with the European Commission um, on research to inform its Better Internet for Kids strategy, the Council of Europe on its recommendation on children's rights in the digital environment, the OECD and ITU on their policies on child online protection, and UNICEF on the Global Kids Online Research to identify children's opportunities and risks online. Um, and my current work um, the, with the Five Rights Foundation and um, with whom I now lead the Digital Futures Commission. So I'll draw on all of that, but I'm going to focus uh, on the work I did uh, for the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child in drafting General Comment 25 on children's rights in relation to the digital environment. And as the title of today's lecture says, I'm especially concerned with the challenges of implementation. I just check that I'm talking loud enough. Or, yeah, happy. Good. So before I continue, I'd like to thank the many colleagues who I've worked closely with throughout all these projects, including on the present text. And I'd like to note that I'm not a lawyer, but a psychologist. And it was initially as a psychologist researching children's digital lives um, that I found myself wanting to understand why it matters, what can result from the claim in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child that, quote, childhood is entitled to special care and assistance. But in recent years, I have worked a lot with lawyers, technologists, policymakers, and others, and I've become fascinated with this very multi-stakeholder process um, of deliberation and collaboration, uh, recognizing what a lot of work it takes for us all to understand each other well. So, to children's rights. Uh, as you know, uh, the Convention sets out children's rights as an obligation for all signatories, and the Committee on the Rights of the Child um, has been elected by states that ratified it to scrutinise their process in implementing children's rights. The Committee also makes recommendations on measures to strengthen compliance, for example, in their concluding observations when they visit countries, and by producing general comments. Committee member Olga Kazova has said, general comments should be regarded as the committee's jurisprudence, 
the means by which, quote, the committee makes recommendations on any issue relating to children to which it believes state parties should devote more attention. This has included business, and importantly, General Comment 16 builds on the UN Guiding Principles on Business Human Rights in clarifying that, surprisingly um, to some big tech companies, that not just states, but also businesses are duty bearers who must protect and respect human rights, including children's rights, if their activities impact on their rights and practice. And most recently, the committee has deemed that states should devote more attention to the digital environment. So General Comment 25 originated in 2014, when the committee held a day of general discussion on children and what they then called digital media, to weigh the emerging arguments and evidence for a new general comment. A few years later, the committee determined that the convention needed better implementation in a digital world. Um, as you know, it had been drafted before the invention of the World Wide Web in 1989 and was adopted that same year. And I led the drafting team working with the committee with funding and coordination by the Five Rights Foundation. In all, it took seven years of advocacy, research, and multi-stakeholder consultation before the committee formally adopted General Comment 25 in February 19, uh, 2021. And in the frame, importantly, are all states and many businesses because the general comment applies not just to those specifically concerned with or targeting children, but to those likely to have child users or to impact in a significant way on children's rights because those states, because those businesses now operate online. And as I said before, that includes impacts on children who do not themselves have internet access, but might be affected, for example, by processes of digital birth registration or automated processing that determines health provision. General Comment 25 emphasizes the importance of international cooperation, which is vital given the global nature of the major tech companies and the transnational nature of the digital environment together with both its opportunities and its risks. And it was um, interesting that it was the international NGOs and intergovernmental organizations that gave General Comment 25 its warmest welcome last year. So on publication, it was promptly recognized by the End Violence Against Children program, um, the ITU, the World Childhood Foundation, the WHO, UNESCO, ECPAT International, many more. So such recognition can help to change the discourse and to reset priorities in both child rights and internet governance circles. Um, and it's interesting to compare it with some other general comments, so that on play, um, which was adopted fairly recently, is an important topic to those in child rights circles, but lacks, as it were, prominent um, champions or very evident um, problems, uh, challenges going wrong. And it seems to me that, by contrast, stakeholders were in a way hungry for uh, authoritative guidance on child rights and the digital environment, and whether they follow it uh, is another matter. Um, clearly, children children's experiences in digital contexts are the focus of many media scares and scandals and we see public platforms increasingly being uh, publicly held to account for their responsibilities to human rights including children's so as a kind of call to action as an authoritative point of reference and um, an agreed language for deliberation um, general comment 25 is proving useful so we do see increasing representation by and on behalf of children in the annual Internet Governance Forum. We see more research and awareness raising activities by the International Telecommunication Union and many public statements on child rights and internet governance are now coming out by UN agencies, special rapporteurs and more. And a host of multi-stakeholder collaborations are now especially addressing child online sexual abuse and exploitation, the trade in child sexual abuse material, child trafficking, extremist recruitment, datification, increasingly also commercial exploitation, biased algorithms discriminating against certain groups of children, and so on. Unusual in relation to internet governance, where children's voices go generally unheard, the text of General Comment 25 explicitly includes the voices of children, um, and in accordance with the Convention right to be heard in matters that affect them, 
the children's consultation for the general comment included diverse children from around the world in 26 countries, mainly in the global south, um, through a consultation led by Professor Amanda Bird at Western Sydney University. In the drafting process, I can tell you that what the children said was a frequent point of reference. We marked up many versions of the draft during the, the rounds of drafting and revisions, um, and we marked them up to highlight how we had responded to what the children said in the consultation, what their concerns, hopes, and aspirations were. And what were they? The children's consultation made it clear that children want to engage in digital spaces without fear of undue criticism, harassment, discrimination, or aggression, so they can express themselves, advocate on issues that they care about, assert their identities, and actively participate online. But they fear that by using technology to speak out on issues that they care about, they may encounter discrimination or risks to their safety. Children are concerned that adults do not respect their right to participate online, saying that even their own parents or caregivers would dismiss or denigrate their online expression. Further, while, while children are passionately keen to be part of the digital world, they regard it as their world, they are greatly frustrated by faults in its designs and policies. Children from every region in the world called on states, businesses, and civil society to do more to ensure that children can participate in the digital world without fear of serious harm. And in this, they concurred with the, the committee's determination to regard protection and participation as mutually enforcing, mutually reinforcing, rather than in conflict, as we sometimes hear in public deliberation. So let me elaborate that point a little. I think it's, it's important in relation to digital or internet governance. So in human rights frameworks, it's often said that there can be no ranking of rights, at least in principle. Rights are in indivisible, inalienable, and interdependent. But for some adults, dubbed sometimes the child savers, keeping children safe online fulfills the obligation to secure children's rights. So a common paradigm privileges protection at the expense of children's other rights and is undoubtedly the driver for many national and international efforts in relation to children's rights um, and digital technologies, which is the, to be the mitigation of threats for children's safety and welfare, rather than, or even sometimes instead of, the promotion of children's civil rights and freedoms. For the committee, though, children's participation rights are fundamental to the exercise of all their other rights. As Jerison Lansdowne, who was also on the drafting team, said, a child rights approach demands a broader vision of protection as a positive promotion of dignity, optimal development, and well-being. And yet, as Olga Kazava observed, it remains a challenge for society to accept that children's evolving capacities and immaturity should not be interpreted as an excuse for restricting children's autonomy and self-expression. The general comment 25, the starting point was recognizing that meaningful access to the digital environment affords children an extraordinary potential for education, culture, the arts, friendship, information, civic engagement, networking, and beyond. And so although the tension between participation and protection surfaced throughout the external consultations on the concept note, on the zero draft, the committee was clear that this is a false binary. On the one hand, the very point of creating a safe environment for children online with content moderation, aid rating, stage protection, codes of conduct and safety measures, as we'll discuss today. The very point of doing all of that is to facilitate children's opportunities to participate and, for example, to access valuable online resources. On the other hand, all the protective legislation, policies and codes of conduct in the world will not be sufficient to keep children safe if children are not also educated to recognize potentially abusive situations and enabled to seek out and form constructive connections. And experience shows that protections will work much more effectively if children are consulted in their design and development. Still, some kind of weighing of rights seems to be required in practice, and businesses operating in the digital environment say that this is one of their biggest challenges. 
So Article um, 3.1 of the um, Convention on the Rights of the Child demands that in all actions affecting children, their best interests must be a primary consideration. And in relation to the digital environment, respecting children's best interests seems to be emerging internationally as a way of balancing and weighing their rights. For instance, the best interests of the child are written into the UK's data protection regime via the Age Appropriate Design Code, and this has triggered a range of improvements from social media platforms in their treatment of children's data with implications for their safety. But the very com complexity of the concept of best interest allows scope for evasion, with companies seemingly picking and choosing which changes to make. For example, Meta has recently developed a best interest framework, citing the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, I think perhaps for the first time, yet merely packaging old policies in new wrappings. So, for example, although it's an accepted interpretation in child rights circles that a child's best interest should trump commercial exploitation of their data by profiling for advertising processes, this is not evident in Better's framework, which instead highlights the provision of new parental control tools. The committee has been clear that primary, best interest should be a primary consideration, sets a significant threshold that should not be downplayed. They said, quote, the child's best interest may not be considered on the same level as all other considerations, and this strong position is justified by special citation of the child, dependency, maturity, legal <coughs> status, and often voicelessness. But despite this growing attention to the idea of best interest, few governance experts or tech companies seem to know, for example, that General Comment 14 sets out a practical framework and accountable mechanism for weighing children's best interests, including, perhaps especially, when evaluating the implication for children's rights of a new policy, service, or decision. And this general comment is precisely designed to ensure that the concept's application goes beyond that rather woolly sense of what adults think is best for children. Further, although general comment 25 requires that states should, quote, ensure transparency in the assessment of the best interests of the child and the criteria that have been applied. I haven't seen this done yet, though the ICO is developing a best interests framework. And making um, transparent the factors that they weigh when making that best interest decision appears very far from business intentions, as does consulting children in the process. A second major challenge in interpreting General Comment or in implementing General Com Comment 25 relates to the very concept of the child. Following um, Article 5, General Comment 25 requires that states and parents respect the quote evolving capacities of the child as an enabling principle <coughs> that addresses the process of their gradual acquisition of competences, understanding, and agency. It adds, quote, that the process has particular significance in the digital environment where children can engage more independently from supervision by parents and caregivers. And there was strong support in the consultation responses uh, across diverse stakeholder groups that to address the different needs of children at different ages, the state must prioritize support for parents and caregivers through guidance and awareness raising, particularly in relation to the digital environment. And that the state must exercise a duty of care where parents cannot or do not ensure an age-appropriate and rights-respecting experience for their children, as well as for children who are at risk from their parents. But the role of parents um, remains controversial, um, particularly um, because of the position of digital companies in relation to uh, the US, the only state not to have ratified the convention, um, in part precisely because the US prioritizes, quote, parent rights over child rights. In other parts of the world, too, parental authority is near sacrosanct, um, as many of the consultation responses commented, yet while yet others contested this prioritization, echoing what must be said are long-standing struggles in the child rights community um, about parent versus child um, uh, agency and rights, which are now playing out in relation to the new challenges of the digital. 
will know that before um, uh, the, the, the digital moment, there has been a long history of age ratings, uh, age classification, and more recently parental control tools to try to kind of regulate children's access to television, advertising, films, computer games, um, and other media according to their age, even though this has often been ineffective and highly contested. Even this is difficult to extend now to the digital media content available to all. Um, uh, consider that regulation to prevent children's access to pornography online has proved very controversial. So not only are there issues of principle relating to freedom of expression, but also in practice age determination is challenging in more ways than one. Clearly self-declaring one's age to a social media platform, for example, is an inadequate mechanism, widely flouted. Yet the alternatives, possibly linked to some official systems of digital identity or biometric indicators, such as facial <coughs> recognition, raise um, urgent privacy concerns. My third challenge concerns outreach to those who build the digital products and systems that are transforming children's, actually all of our daily lives. Um, this is because, of, as you'll have seen, I'm, uh, I see the role of business as critical to realizing children's rights in a digital world. Um, even though the convention and the general comment are, of course, uh, primarily uh, addressed to states, and no question there's a lot to say about the role of states, as I think we'll get to uh, in the panel that follows, um, at the Digital Futures Commission, with, with five rights, we've been um, thinking about what businesses can do when they ask what they can do, which they often ask. Um, and we're working on a toolkit for child rights by design to be launched in the spring. So here the idea is to build on and integrate those efforts for uh, safety, security, and privacy by design into a kind of one-stop shop for implementing the general comment. And I've been thinking a lot about whether we can encourage the practices of digital providers so they respect and even promote children's rights. One example of how one might facilitate this, General Comment 25 says, quote, state parties should require the business sector to undertake, uh, to undertake child rights due diligence, in particular to carry out child rights impact assessments and disclose them to the public with special consideration given to the differentiated and at times severe impacts of the digital environment on children. And some businesses are taking note. So last this year, uh, I was invited as an independent, unpaid expert as part of internal child rights impact assessments being undertaken by Google and by um, BT Group. And yet, I can see that crucial elements are missing from these and related initiatives. Uh, no transparency regarding risk assessment, no accountable weighing of alternative interventions, bearing in mind the full range of children's rights, no clear processes for evaluating or publishing the results. Interestingly too, endorsement of child rights, impact assessments and related measures are finding their way into national regulation. And so again, the um, UK's Age Appropriate Design Code which is now being taken up by the Irish Information Commissioner, which matters for big tech operating in the European Union, and it, uh, taken up by California, home of Silicon Valley, and spreading elsewhere, especially across Europe. <coughs> we should also consider the Youth Protection Act in Germany, the Dutch Code for Children's Rights, as a kind of wave of initiatives um, with more or less um, uh, binding nature that are embedding some um, mechanisms like child rights impact assessments. But while acknowledging some positive efforts and some promising case studies, our desk research and interviews with child rights experts indicates that when it comes to digital technologies, translating child rights into practice is likely to be an especially uphill battle. Part of this is the lack of wider implementation of child rights frameworks for example, um, the UK government made a commitment to integrate the Convention on the Rights of the Child, including child rights impact assessments, into its public decision-making processes, but this has never been made a statutory obligation, despite the recommendation of the committee uh, to the UK in its concluding observations in 2016. 
So the non-binding nature of child rights instruments leaves the floor clear for strong business incentives to overlook impacts on child, children's rights. And many companies, as we know, prioritize, struggle to prioritize even something as important as children's safety from inappropriate content or contact risks. So while larger companies make grand claims about doing the right thing, confident that public scrutiny of their opaque internal operations is nearly impossible, startups and independent designers we have found in our interviews are franker. So one startup designer told us at the Digital Futures Commission, when you talk about the developers, these are guys who I know who sit in Silicon Valley, they're incentivized to do anything they can to build these dopamine hits. They don't care about the impact of what this does on children, what this does on anyone. An independent uh, UX designer specializing in interactive environments for children told us, the ideal, of course, is those who think about child rights in terms of let's go read the design guidelines. They are the intrinsically motivated designers who want to make a difference, but they're the minority, right? So the majority just do what they need to do, and those leading companies usually have other interests in mind, and they'll go by the regulations. So for sure, none of this is easy, and we could see from our interviews with digital providers that they are um, uncertain how to inform or task their design teams to consider child rights. They're unclear when in the development process or the instigation of which department these by design solutions should be embedded. They fear that consulting children will reveal new problems or require them to consider alternatives that, don't, that they can't address. And certainly they don't want to make public any of this process um, during the design and development nor evaluate afterwards what they found difficult. So to conclude, General Comment 25 clearly asserts that children's rights apply online as they do offline, and in so doing it demarcates a clear and pressing task for internet governance, that of securing the full range of children's provision, protection and participation rights as they play out in and in relation to the digital environment. Yet realising children's rights in relation to the digital environment is still regarded as difficult by policymakers, as expensive by businesses, and many are fearing that the result will be an excessively regulated, even childish internet for all. Child rights advocates, on the other hand, fear that children's lives will be deliberately or inadvertently circumscribed within ever more narrow and potentially heavily commercialized walled gardens as child safety and adult freedoms are prioritized over other child rights. Yet traditionally, children have lived in the world with adults, and especially in high-income countries, they've also had access to resources demarcated for them and their needs. Think of schools, libraries, parks, playgrounds, dedicated children's media, and so forth. And the provision of design and design of these spaces have allowed for children's graduated integration into the wider world, and embedded, if you like, um, ways of managing and um, implementing children's best interests and evolving capacities. But the internet has reconfigured uh, the norms regarding differentiated spaces of action, um, along with their embedding in culturally specific contexts in ways that have created a more or less borderless online environment accessible globally and used by billions of users. So addressing children's evolving capacities and ensuring that their best interests are met are proving particularly challenging in our digital world. So I often hear internet governance experts kind of apologetically deferring attention to other spaces or future times generally unspecified. Um, and even though we've seen growing attention to concerning statistics, victim stories, media panics, civil society demands for children's rights in this space, they are still fighting for attention on the internet governance agenda. The alternatives, holding parents solely responsible for the impact of opaque global technologies on their children's welfare, this is becoming ever more implausible. Blaming children, another common response for the problems they encounter online because they were supposedly misbehaving or lying about their age or being in places they shouldn't be. All of this inappropriately responsibilizes children for the adverse outcomes they suffer. 
And omitting mention of children in internet governance policies and practice is beginning to look less like a deferral and more like a determination to imagine the public as invulnerable adults and to disparage any special pleading on behalf of others. So whether or not general comment 25 is the instrument for change, as I believe it, it can be, or along with others, change is definitely coming. And I look forward to discussing with all of you here what changes are needed, how they can be brought about, so that children too can benefit from the digital transformations we are all living through. Thank you.